بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that وأن ترى الحفاة العراة العالة رعاء الشاء. With the first, it actually says one of the signs of the end will be in this hadith of Bukhari, and it's something that we are seeing with our own eyes in this time. We're living it. We're actually visiting it. We're going there and seeing it. That you will see that a person is rabbataha. You will see that a slave girl, a slave woman is giving birth to her master. The slave girl is giving birth to her master. You will see the barefoot, very barely dressed, barefoot, clad in very simple clothes, camel herder, that he will be, they will compete, these nomad Arabs, barefoot, very skimpy clothes, very minimal clothes on their body, barefoot in the desert, camel herders, they'll be competing with one another in high-rise buildings. Brothers and sisters, for 14 centuries, this hadith would be taught. For 14 centuries, this hadith is in Bukhari. This hadith is Jibreel. Al-Iman, wal-Islam, wal-Ihsan, wa-amaratu sa'a. What is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? And lastly, Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet, what are the signs of the end of times? To which he mentioned two things. That you see the slave girl giving birth to her master. What does that mean? It means that you will see a complete degeneration of the culture. Complete degeneration of respect. That it will be as if the mother gave birth to the one who's going to be telling her what to do. And we see in this day and age, so many stories that the son went, he was so angry, he killed his mom. Why did he kill his mom? He said, you know, why didn't you cook me breakfast like this? Just recently this happened. How come you did like this and you're telling me like this and, you know, son is putting a knife to his own mother's throat. I have had many situations where the mothers came to me. He said, please, Sheikh, tell me what to do. My own son put a knife to my throat. My own son has put a knife to my throat. And the, the meaning is specific, but there is a principle in this. That the, 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 the slave girl will give birth to her master, meaning the roles and responsibilities of human beings will be flipped upside down. Mother and father is no longer mother and father. Mother and father is servant. Is it or is it not, brothers and sisters, those who are mothers and fathers? Many mothers and fathers feel this, that it's as if we are serving our children. Our children are not serving us. This is hadith of the Prophet. We are seeing it. We're witnessing it. We're living it. Therapists are talking about it. Therapists are, are, are in, in it. They're, they're living it. If we were to go into, subhanAllah, some of the details of the signs of the end of times, you can go on a spiritual level, on an emotional level, on a psychological level, on a sociological level, on a political level, there is signs in every aspect. Literally, you will see, like the Prophet ﷺ is painting the portrait of our time, from that time. He's literally painting the portrait, like describing exactly as we are living it. Is this not had happened, brothers and sisters? Has, is this not happening? That the roles and responsibilities have completely flipped upside down? that the women are wearing the pants in the house, the woman has become the husband, the husband is becoming, right? Now it's, you know, men are giving birth and men are breastfeeding and men are like a complete roles and responsibilities. What is it happening? Everything has been flipped upside down. The men are women, the women are men. Everything has been flipped, inverted system. And, and you will see the barefoot and barely dressed camel herders. They will be, you will be competing in high-rise buildings, subhanAllah. For 14 centuries, the scholars of hadith, when they're explaining this, they didn't know how can this be. We believe in it. Allahu alam. We believe in it. Imagine, brothers and sisters, I'll, I'll give you a scenario. A lot of people today, 
they reject hadith based upon that this doesn't make sense. How can this be? This, does, this does, goes against the aql. Let me ask you a question. How does this go according to aql? That you have a camel herder whose house is a tent and he's going to be building huge buildings, not only building, competing with one another. يتطاولون مطاولة هذا من باب مفاعلة بالعربية يعني يكون الفعل من جانبين They'll be doing it from both sides. It's not one-sided. They'll be competing with one another. One group of nomads will be doing it, and then another group of nomads will be doing it to outdo them. How can you imagine that camel herders can do such a thing? Camel herders, all they do is milk the, milk the camels and you know, go and look for grazing pastures in the desert. Nobody imagined that they could even build a, build a building. They don't live in buildings. So then somebody says, oh, Na'udhu Billah, Na'udhu Billah, Muhammad doesn't know what he's talking about. Look at what he's saying. We're supposed to believe this? They don't live in houses. How are they going to build houses? So based on certain person might be looking at the hadith according to his aql. And then he's rejecting it. Whereas he doesn't know that 70, 80 years ago, technology, past the industrial revolution, all of these you know, things, the Khalij and the Arabs, they struck black gold. They struck black gold. Now they're multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar, you know, oil companies. The West is indebted to them. In 1970s, in the 1970s, right, what had happened was there was an embargo of the oil, right? There was an embargo of oil. Everything has, had, had been cut off. There was a huge problem because Saudi Arabia and the, the U.S. Had, a, had an issue regarding the oil. Oil prices and gas prices went up beyond imagination. They were the ones who were controlling it from that time. There was a picture. You can go online and see it. The, uh, when did they call the Burj Khalifa? That, the father of Khalifa, him, the elder, the first of the uh, sheikhs, quote-unquote, oil sheikh, the first of the oil sheikhs of the Khalij, they have his picture that he is holding a camel on the sand with his feet bare. You must see this. You see it with your own eyes. This is the promise of the Prophet. This is the prophecy of the Prophet. This is a picture from maybe 60 or 70 years ago that his feet are bare on the sand and he's wearing a long thobe and he's holding the rein of the camel. And when they struck oil, what happened? They made one of the biggest buildings ever to be built in the world. Saudi Arabia, the Najdis, which is another, another clan of the Bedouins, then they started building in Jidda. They're gonna build the biggest clock tower in Jidda. And like this, it's going back and forth. They have a plan. They have a plan actually. Over 20, 30 years, all the high-rise buildings that are going to be built, while all the other countries around them, Syria and Yemen and Afghanistan and Iraq, people are dying of hunger. Their own people. And this is that the Bedouins building high-rise buildings, and they're still Bedouin. They have no concern. How are we spending our billions? We're, bu we're putting it in Turab. We're putting it in steel. We're putting it in glass so that we can build it, so we can make tafakhur. I am better than him. Oh, who does he think he is? I'm from this tribe. Same Bedouin mentality. People go to, oh, we're going to go to Dubai. We're going to see the Burj Khalifa. You're seeing the manifestation of Bedouin mentality. That is a sorry, a, a sorry representation of humanity. It's not something to be proud of. That people are spend, spending billions on a building while countries around them, the people are starving from hunger. What is that? That's Bedouin mentality, where you're putting your money. Yeah, you know, people come from far and wide and they say, wow. That's the extent of it. And that's exactly what it was. It, that's what, it, what it's for. Can anybody tell me any other objective of that? Does anybody know any good other, like, humanity-saving objective? 
How many humans did that, that Burj Khalifa save? How many lives did it, did it save? How many hungry people did it feed? Khair, we're going off of topic. The point is, these two that we see, the, you know, the change of roles, the disintegration of society, and the roles in society. And secondly, we see almost impossible things happening, becoming possible, right? That you see the you know, Bedouins building high-rise buildings. In our lifetime, we see this hadith manifesting itself. In our own lifetime, we see and witnessing this. So with that being said, this is our first objective in these ahadith. To have, to build our confidence, our certainty in this very great miracle of the Prophet. Allah wa inni utitul Qur'ana wa mithlahu ma'ahu. Verily, I have been given this Qur'an and I have been given something miraculous like this Qur'an. What is the other thing that the Prophet was given? He was given the hadith. The hadith is also inspiration into the heart of Muhammad sallallahu Read, I'll tell you brothers, you read this and you just, your mind will be boggled. You'll be, you'll be mind boggled. It's as if he's literally, he has like binoculars and he's looking into the future and explaining, you know, point by point, exactly what is happening in our time. So that's point number one. Point number two, what's the objective of studying these signs? Is just like when you go to the DMV, and the, you, you study the road signs. Red light means stop. Yellow light means be careful. Be ready to stop. Green light means keep going. So the sign and the knowledge of the sign tells you what you need to do. When we're studying the signs of the end of time, these signs tell us how we need to prepare, what we need to do, how we need to act, if you don't know what the green light means, you're going to stop at the green light. If you don't know, you go to the DMV, you study, and you don't study, you'll be stopping at the green light, you're causing a traffic jam, you're causing an accident. And if you're running on the red, you're causing another accident. So the signs and the knowledge of the signs teach us that when we are there and we see it, there's a specific thing we're supposed to do. This is the second reason. And then the third reason is that this is one of the pillars of deen. The Prophet ﷺ said, in the hadith of Jibreel, that mal iman. What is iman? That an tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawmil akhiri. That long hadith the Prophet ﷺ said, when Jibreel asked him, what is Iman? He said that you believe in Allah, you believe the angels, you believe in the prophets, you believe in the books, you believe in the last day, you believe in destiny. Right? This is Iman. And he said, okay, then what is Islam? So he said, Islam is that you will bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship but Allah. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is his messenger. And you pray your five daily prayers, and you fast in the month of Ramadan, and you give the zakat, and you do the hajj if you have the financial and physical capacity to do so. That's right. Okay, then what's Ihsan? Ihsan is that you should worship Allah as if you see Him. You should worship Allah, you should try to work on your heart that you worship Him as if you see Him. And if not that, then know that He at least sees you. He said, right. And then lastly, He said, tell me, when is the Day of Judgment? He said, I do not know. The, the, the one who is being questioned does not know more than the questioner. He said, okay, then tell me the signs. And then the Prophet mentioned those two signs. So then when Jibreel left, and the Prophet said to Umar, Ya Umar, do you know what that, what, what that was all about? Do you know what, what, what was going on? He said, what? He said, Daka Jibreel. Daka Jibreel, Jibreel. Atakum yu'allimukum deenakum. That was Jibreel salam that came to you to teach you about your religion. So from this we know that Iman, Islam, Ihsan, and then there's a last one. That last one is knowing the signs, right? Just like in the DMV, you need to know how to drive, you need to know how to stop, but you have to know the signs. Knowing the signs is wajib. You're not going to pass the test in the DMV if you don't know the signs. And you're not going to pass the test of your deen if you don't know the signs. Why? Because when those signs come, you will fall into it if you don't know it.
If that hole comes, if that trap comes, if that ditch comes, and you don't know that there's a ditch coming there, you're going to fall inside the ditch. مَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفِ الْمَهَالِكِ يَقَعُ فِيهَا مَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفَ الْمَهَالِكِ The one who does not know the destructive things, he's going to fall inside of it. So with that being said, Islamic eschatology can be divided into three parts. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help. Allahumma yassir umurana, washrah sudurana, wakhtim bis salihati amalana. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla. Wa anta taj'al al-hazana idha shi'ta sahla. Fasahil umurana, washrah sudurana, wakhtim bis salihati amalana. This is a very difficult topic. And I ask Allah ta'ala's help to, it's very, very vast. And it's very, very difficult, but we can summarize it in, in three categories, three chapters. Number one is the fitan. Number two, malahim. And number three, asharatu sa'a. So these are three chapters, three sections of these lessons. The hadith of the Prophet covers these three major, how do you say, um, headings. Three major headings. Three major chapters. Al-Fitan, Wal-Malahim, Wa Ashrat al sa So we, we're going to be starting with the Fitan. The Fitan are, Fitan is the Jama'a, Fitna. And Fitna means Al-Imtihan, Wal-Ikhtibar, Wal-Baliyya. It's a test, it's a trial, it's a um, predicament which tests your faith. It puts you through a predicament. It's a trial. It, 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 it brings out what's inside of you. It brings out what's real. Like for example, all of us right now, mashallah, we're all sitting here together. But now, there's something that happens, or there's a fight, or there's an argument. Now, how we conduct ourselves, how we respond to that, shows what's inside of our hearts. This is, the, this is what a fitna and a baliya is. Fitna is a test of iman. That when that fitna comes, you're being tested. You're, you, you're, Allah Ta'ala is testing what is inside of you to see, do you have true iman inside of your heart or is there hypocrisy inside of your heart? So this is point number one. Malahim is another category. And malahim comes from malhama. Malhama. Wal malhama tu hiyal maqtala. Malhama means wars and killing. So we know that first the tests and tribulations came, and then there was near the end of time, and this is what even in the Christian, in the Ahl Kitab, they believe the Armageddon. How many of you heard the word Armageddon? Right? The Armageddon, they say, is the final war. So the malahim or the malhama is going to be talking about the major wars of the end of times. Or it could be much more than just the wars and the battles. It could be major happenings. Right. And the word malhama comes from laham. Laham. Malhama. Laham, it means flesh. Because in a battle, so much flesh is laying around. Or it could be like in the battles in the olden days, when, they would, when the armies would hit together like this, you know, when two armies would actually come together. And it was called zahaf. They would crowd together like this, and it would be that their bodies are literally attached to one another when they're fighting. And malhama could be coming from that. An interesting point here it says from the names of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Nabiyul Malhama, the Prophet of War. This is one of the names. And this indicates that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, along with his mercy and along with his Jamal, he had the side of Jalal. He had the side of being a person who would stand for the truth and defend the truth if he had to with his life. And this shows us the sign of right, the Prophet ﷺ being one of the signs of the end of times as well. 
One of the important things to understand in this before we begin is the Prophet ﷺ said, I was sent with the day of judgment like this. And he made an indication with his finger like he put his index and his middle finger together like this. I have been sent along with the day of judgment like this. Meaning the distance between me and the coming of the day of judgment is very short time. Right? Some say it's like from the tip of the index finger to the tip of the middle finger like that. So it shows closeness and it shows like that. It could be either like this or the tip of the index finger to the tip of the... It's just almost there. Yani, we're almost at that point. And if anybody is listening to this, you'll be like, wow, that seems like it's pretty close. If you hear some of these ahadith that we're going to read, you're going to know that we're in it. So we, I'm going to first explain the fitan, then the malahim, wars that are going to be, or huge incidents that are going to happen. And then you have the asharat. The asharat. Asharat are the signs. The, in, the, the more, and then in the signs you have alamatul kubra, alamatul sughra. The major signs of the end of times and the minor signs of the end of times. So these are three chapters. The fitnas, yani the Prophet is telling us about the tests and tribulations that are going to come. Number two, we're going to be learning about the major incidents and wars that are going to manifest. And then three, the major and the minor signs. May Allah give tawfiq. Now, before I begin, an uh, important thing to take into consideration is when the Prophet ﷺ was sent, the sending of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet himself from amongst all the messengers, they knew that he, is the, he was the Nabiyu Akhir is Zaman. Our Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he is Nabiyu Akhir is Zaman. He is not the Prophet. Adam alayhi salam was Nabiyu Awal is Zaman, right? Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam was Ruhullah. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam was Kalimullah. Sayyidina Adam was Safiullah. Each one of them had their qualities. But Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam was specifically known amongst all the prophets and messengers. Nabiyu Akhir is Zaman. The Yahud and the Jews who had settled in Medina Munawwara, they knew him. And they entitled him that the Nabi Akhir Zaman is going to be coming here to this city of Yathrib, to the city of Medina. So one of the things we must understand is the Prophet himself was one of the signs of the end of times. The Bi'athat of the Prophet was a sign of the end of time. The passing and the death of the Prophet was also one of the signs of the end of times. So this is one very important thing to understand. Secondly, when the Prophet ﷺ was selected as a messenger, they said that all of the heavens were closed with the wahi that was coming. In Surah Jinn, the devils, the shayateen, they say, فَمَنْ يَسْتَمِعِ الْآنَ يَجِدْ لَهُ شِهَابَ الرَّسَدَ That before, we used to go and we used to try to listen uh, to the decrees of Allah Azza wa Jal that would be coming down and we would try to stop any revelation that's coming from the heavens and cause a disruption. He said, but now something has happened. What's going on? Any time that we try to go and interfere with the angels coming down, then we have a meteor that is coming to strike us. And this, is in the, this is mentioned in the Quran. From this we understand that there is, from the beginning, there is a tug of war between good and evil, between the devil and the angels between the forces of darkness and the forces of light, between the forces of good and the forces of evil, there's this constant tug of war. And when Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa came, the devils actually said that we would want to go up to interrupt the revelation from coming down. My dear brothers and sisters, one of the jobs of the shaitan and the devil is to not allow you to come to the masjid to not allow you to read Qur'an, to not allow you to wear hijab, to not allow you to do good deeds. Wallahi, I know 
Many, many people came to me. He said, Sheikh, I, as soon as I started coming to the masjid and as soon as I started to pray, I start getting all these bad things happening to me. I'm seeing nightmares. I'm getting these thoughts. I'm getting attacked. I don't know what to do. I said, exactly. Your shaitan is very strong. Shaitan does not want under any circumstance for you to come to the house of Allah. Shaitan does not want you for any, any circumstance to be away from your phone for one second. Right? That's the gateway of shaitan to get you to all the things to distract you. So when the Prophet ﷺ came, it was a battle. There was a group of shayateen that actually came to burn the Prophet ﷺ in Medina Munawwara. And Jibreel ﷺ came and taught him a long dua. And he would read that dua and that, you know, uh, repelled the devils that were trying to attack the Prophet ﷺ. They cannot harm him. He's the Nabi of Allah. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, I was in prayer, and he said that a devil came near me, and he tried to spit on me. He said, I felt the wetness of that spit on my hand. He said, I would have grabbed him by the neck, and I would have tied him to a pillar, so that the, all the children of Medina could see that I caught this devil and I tied him. He said, but I remembered the dua of my brother Sulaiman. The dua of my brother Sulaiman was that, Oh Allah Ta'ala, give me such a kingdom that nobody has. So I said, leave it for my brother. Then he'll say, why does somebody else have it? I leave it for my brother. Otherwise, if it wasn't for that dua of my brother, I would show you that I'll tie this devil and all the children of Madi. So we can see that there's this constant stoppage. The devil, the shayateen. There was a, a moment in Makkah Mukarramah when the Prophet ﷺ was giving da'wah in the 10th year of Nubuwat. The Quraysh was fed up with the Prophet. And they said, look, we need to get together. We need to solve this issue. We need to solve this problem of Muhammad. Na'udhu Billah. What should we do? So all of them got together. He said, you know what? We'll make him go to another far off place. Another person said, no, we'll, we'll make him, you know, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll make an agreement with him. We'll make a, a truce with him. So they had different, different things. And an old man came and the old man said, none of your advices are good. Let me tell you what you should do. He said, one young man from every tribe, gather together and go in the middle of the night where he is sleeping. And from all of the tribes, every man, every young man from every different clan of Quraysh should stab him at once so that now the blame cannot be on one clan. It could be on distributed amongst all the clans and Muhammad can't fight everybody. They said, that is a very good idea. Who are you? He said, don't worry about who I am. And who was that? That was Iblis, that was the devil himself. In other words, in the Dawat of the Prophet and in the life of the Prophet, Shaitan was there and he was involved and he was fighting. Even in the battle of Badr, the devil was there. And in the battle of Badr, he, shaitan was fleeing and he was telling everybody to flee. He said, you were the one who told us to go in the first. He said, no. Inni ara ma la taroon. Inni ara ma la taroon. I see that which you do not see. I see the angels coming down. Run. This is the words of Iblis. It's been preserved in the Quran that in the battle of Badr, shaitan was in, in the saf of the, of the, of the mushrikeen. And he was encouraging them, fight, fight. But then in the middle of the battle, he started running. They said, hey, wait a minute, you're telling us to fight. Why are you going back? He said, I see that which you do not see. From this we understand what? The shaitan and the devil is there plotting at every moment and even in many aspects of the history of the seerah, he is there. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away, I'm going to get to the main point here. I'm getting to the main point. that the message was conveyed in Hijjat al wida in the farewell Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ had all the Sahaba, and he said, Ala qad ballaghd. I have conveyed the message, O oh Allah, to your people. Over 150,000 Sahaba radiallahu anhum were there in that gathering. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Ala qad ballaghd. Verily, O oh Allah, I have conveyed the message to them. Then, after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Now we are coming to what is happening here. What the Prophet ﷺ said is going to happen. 
And this will answer that question that we have, why did the Muslims fight with one another after the Prophet? Why were there so many battles? Why was there so many wars? Why did they start disagreeing? Why things started falling apart? Quote unquote, they say it's falling apart. And in reality, this was not falling apart. These were the signs that the Prophet ﷺ had foretold. These are the fitan that he said, it's going to begin as soon as I will leave this world. These were the signs of the end of times that was happening from his death, from the moment of his demise. And he mentioned this. This hadith is very important. And my dear brothers, this answers the question of those people who say, why did they fight after the Prophet ﷺ? Why is it that everywhere in the Muslim world there's fighting? Has anybody asked this question? You all know, we all know, everywhere and everywhere in the Muslim ummah, there's fighting and it never stops. Even when it stops, it's not stopped. Even when the non-Muslims leave, the Muslims then start amongst themselves. What is this? It's this hadith of the Prophet. You ready? Everything has been answered in the hadith of the Prophet. He said, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ قَدْ يَئِسَ أَنْ يَعْبُدَهُ الْمُصَلُّونَ فِي جَزِيرَةِ الْعَرَبِ Shaytan is completely hopeless that this ummah will start worshipping idols again فِي جَزِيرَةِ الْعَرَبِ in the, Especially in the heart of Islam, Makkah and Medina. He's hopeless. He said, oh man, I can't... You know, remember what I said that from day one that shaitan was trying to mess things up? Even in the life of the Prophet, he was there. Even he would send his armies to hurt the Prophet. He would be involved in the battles. He would be with the mushrikeen. He would be giving mashwara to the mushrikeen. Remember what I was saying that? Look at what the Prophet says. He says, shaitan failed. There will be no more shirk. He was defeated. He tried to take people to Jahannam through shirk. But he was defeated. Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah prevailed and all of the, the Kaaba was removed of the idols. 360 idols, all the idols were broken and the worship of one Allah was spread throughout all of Jaziratul Arab. But, shaitan is not going to leave. He made, a, he made a qasam, didn't he? That I'm going to lead all of your banda astray. I'm going to leave all your slaves astray. Oh Allah. لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ so then what the Prophet said, shaitan is hopeless that there's going to be any shirk. Right? إِلَّا فِي التَّحْرِيشِ بَيْنَهُمْ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ قَيْ يَئِسَ أَنْ يَعْبُدَهُ الْمُصَلُّونَ فِي جَزِيرَةِ الْعَرَبِ إِلَّا فِي التَّحْرِيشِ بَيْنَهُمْ Except in infighting amongst them. This shaitan has a lot of hope. And this shaitan will become successful. Why will shaitan become successful? Because shaitan flows in our minds, in our hearts. Shaitan goes inside of us. And he waswasa. That is why what the last surah of the Quran is about what? Is about this, which is the protection from fitna. مِن شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ أَلَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ Why is that the last surah of the Quran? Because that is the beginning of when you are wanting to tread this path, the devil is going to be after you. The devil is going to put waswasa in you. The devil is going to put thoughts in you. I'm doing something very good. I'm fighting this Muslim. I'm standing up for justice. He's doing something very bad. So I'm going to kill him and get rid of him. Killing another Muslim is good. Now, this is why when we say the fitan, the fitan and the ahadith about the fitan start with the Prophet talking about not to get into fight with Muslims. That is where the ahadith of fitna begin. Have I been, uh, 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 was I able to explain it to you properly? Yani the history that the Prophet came, the devils were constantly in this battle of tug and war, trying to destroy Islam, trying to lead people astray. He failed. He failed to make them worship idols. He failed to take them towards shirk. Right? But there's one thing he did not fail, and he's going to continue to do, and that is in the infighting amongst them. Why is it that he becomes successful in that? Because that comes as a, that comes as a test of our morality. We think we are doing something very good. When we are killing another Muslim, 
We think that we're doing something good. So many, subhanAllah, some of these youngsters, they're encouraged to go in the battle. They said, go, take this AK-47, go and kill the kuffar. Oh, okay, he's going, and then right when he's there, he says, wait a minute, kuffar, I hear azan coming from the masjid across the, the mountain over there. He said, wait a minute, what kind of kuffar, they pray, they're, praying, they're giving azan and they're praying fajr. Subhanallah, what kind of kuffar is this? This is the biggest test. And shaitan has come to that person and made good seem, made bad seem good to him. What was this? This is the fitna. This is the trial. It's a trial of a person's faith. So, Imam al-Qurtubi is very interesting. And even this book, inshallah, that we're going to be reading from, Mishkatul Masabih, in the Kitab al-Fitan, the first few hadith in the Kitab al-Fitan starts with not fighting with another Muslim. So inshallah, I'm going to read some of these hadith and we'll inshallah go and start. I just wanted to give that introduction. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. An Hudayfata, radiyallahu anhu qal, qama fina Rasulullahi maqaman, sallallahu alayhi wa He said, Hudayfa narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day, he stood up and he started giving us a lecture. مَا تَرَكَ شَيْئًا يَكُونُ فِي مَقَامِهِ ذَلِكَ إِلَىٰ قِيَامِ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا حَدَّثَ بِهِ He said the Prophet ﷺ did not leave anything from that time all the way till the Day of Judgment except that he spoke about it. From that moment all the way till the Day of Judgment he did not leave a single thing except that he spoke about it. And then he says حَفِظَهُ مَنْ حَفِظَهُ وَنَسِيَهُ مَنْ نَسِيَهُ The one who remembered it remembered it and the one who forgot it forgot it. قَدْ عَلِمَهُ أَصْحَابِ هَا وَإِنَّهُ لَيَكُونُ مِنْهُ الشَّيْءِ قَدْ نَسِيتُهُ He says, and some of my companions here, they know it, and maybe some of the things I have forgotten. However, فَأَزَاهُ فَأَرَاهُ فَأَذْكُرُهُ But then, I think I forgot it, but then I see that happening, and then I said, yes, the Prophet ﷺ had told us about this. كَمَا يَذْكُرُ الرَّجُلُ وَجْهَ الرَّجُلِ إِذَا غَابَ عَنْهُ like a person who had seen somebody and he forgot about him and then he seen him again. He said, oh yeah, I seen you somewhere. ثُمَّ إِذَا رَآهُ عَرَفَهُ And this hadith is narrated in Bukhari and Muslim. From this we understand that the Prophet ﷺ had told his companions about these signs of the end of times. As, as we continue, Another hadith which is narrated by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, he said, Innaha satakunu fitanun, ala thumma takunu fitanun, ala thumma takunu fitanun. He says, There's gonna be many fitnas, there's gonna be many fitnas, there's gonna be many fitnas. He said, Al Qaidu Khairun min al Mashi fiha. The one who is sitting is better than the one who is standing. Wal Mashi fiha khairun min al Sa'i. The one who is Walking is better than the one who is striving and running. Allah fa ida waqat fa man kana lahu ibulun falyal haq bi ibilihi. He says, when that happens and you have some camels, then go with your camels in the desert. Wa man kana lahu ghanamun falyal haq bi ghanamihi. And if you have some sheep, then go and hang out with your sheep. وَمَنْ كَانَتْ لَهُ أَرْضٌ فَلْيَلْحَقْ بِأَرْضِهِ And anybody who has some land, then go to your land. Get away from this, this, these fights. Don't get involved in these fights. Don't get involved in these head-banging Muslims against Muslims. فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ So one person said, O Messenger of Allah, أَرَأَيْتَ مَنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ إِبْلٌ وَلَا غَنَمٌ وَلَا أَرْضٌ what if a person doesn't have camels? He doesn't have sheep. He doesn't have land like most of us that are sitting here. قَالَ يَعْمِدْ إِلَىٰ سَيْفِهِ فَيَدِّقُ عَلَىٰ حَدِّهِ بِحَجَرٍ He says, take your sword, press it against a rock, and break it under your foot. You have your sword. You did jihad with me. You were with me, your prophet. We did haq jihad. We did the, the, the pure jihad and strove in the path of Allah. Now, never raise your sword against a Muslim. Take your sword, 
push it against the rock and break it with your foot. ثُمَّ لِيَنْجُوا إِنْ اسْتَطَاعَ النَّجَا And then, run away. Run away and stay away as far as you can. اللَّهُمَّ هَلْ بَلَّغْتْ Look at what he says. اللَّهُمَّ هَلْ بَلَّغْتْ this was, one of the, this was the mission of the Prophet to tell his companions this. We know such situations came about where Sahaba had this way, you had to pick sides. It's either this or that. You have to kill. You have no choice. You have to kill a Muslim. Pick a side. The Prophet's saying is, get, run. Subhanallah. Allah hal ballaghd. Oh Allah, have I conveyed? The Prophet ﷺ did not want this, but it was a fitna. Brothers and sisters, what's the meaning of a fitna? The meaning of a fitna is, if you do, you're damned, and if you don't, you're damned. That's what fitna is. You don't know what to do. Sahaba, were, sahaba fell into some of these fitnas. Their iman was tested with these fitnas. And many, many times, after the Prophet ﷺ, in every era, there was... Muslims fighting with Muslims and there are people who are getting involved thinking that we're doing something that is good. فَقَالَ رَجُلْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Now look at what he says. أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ أُكْرِهْتُ حَتَّى يُنْطَلَقَ بِي إِلَىٰ أَحَدِ الصَّفَّيْنِ What if I'm forced and compelled and I'm taken to one of the sides of the army? فَضَرَبَنِي رَجُلٌ بِسَيْفِهِ أو يجيء سهم فيقتلني، and somebody hits me with a sword or an arrow comes and hits me. قال يبوء بإثمي وإثمك ويكون من أصحاب النار. He said if that happens, then he will be carrying your sin and he will be carrying his own sin and he will be from the people of the fire. And in another narration, Subhanallah, it says, you be like the other brother of Adam. Habil and Qabil were two brothers, right? That when your brother comes to kill you. You be like your other brother Adam. The other brother of Adam, Qabil, a Habil. Do not kill your brother. Whatever you do, don't die with blood on your hands. Allahu Akbar. He says in another hadith, and basically, what is it saying? This is saying that these killings and these wars in which Muslims are killing Muslims, this is the greatest fitna in and of itself. Why is it a fitna? It's a test, it's a trial. Because like I said, if you don't do it, what, you're not standing up for truth? You're not trying to get rid of disorder in the community? You're not getting rid of facade and corruption? This is what we're doing. These people are corrupt. We want to stop them. Okay, let me go. And in actuality, you have, without, without any doubt, you have the blood of a Muslim on your hands. He's corrupt, yeah, but it's a Muslim. Do you want that in your hand? Yani it's, do you see the fitna in that? The test in that? Because there are many, many situations where you have to stand up for the truth, you have to stand up for the haq, you have to stop evil, you have to stop corruption. Without a doubt, it happened throughout the, throughout the years and throughout the centuries. But here the Prophet is telling us, you know, what, why this is a fitna and why this is a test. One Osama ibn Zayd, Osama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu narrates, أشرف النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم على أطم من آطام المدينة. Osama ibn Zayd said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم one day, he climbed on one of the elevated places or the, one of the hills of Medina and he was looking at the houses. He looked down at the houses. فقال هل ترون ما أرى? Do you see what I see? They said, no, we do not see what you see. He says, I see fitna descending upon your homes, just like the rain is descending, just like rain descends. The fitna is coming down on you. And what happened is we know that in the time of Osman ibn Affan, the army of Yazid actually came, and it was waqatul harra. There was a situation where the army of Yazid literally killed hundreds of people. And also they came in and they killed Osman radiallahu anhu. Who are those people who killed Osman radiallahu anhu? Muslims. They're thinking they're doing something good. One of the people entered in the house of Osman. He, the Prophet is seeing the fitna coming down. They think they're doing something good. That's why it's very important, brothers and sisters, for us to know these ahadith. Because in your mind, you're probably thinking, how could they have done like this? But how could they have not? They're human beings. Shaitan is around us. 
The Prophet is telling us, I have conveyed the message. Shaitan is hopeless now. He's not going to be making us worship idols, but he's going to make us fight with one another. If you're in that situation, run away. Never get your hand defiled with the blood of a Muslim. The person who killed Usman, he is a Muslim. While Usman radiallahu he's reading the Quran, the guy who comes in, he kicks the Mus'haf out of the way, and his wife comes to stop, chopping off the fingers of the wife of Sayyidina Uthman, Naila. Her, her hand, fingers get chopped off, trying to stop. And still that Quran is preserved, the blood of Sayyidina Uthman fell inside of the, the Quran when they had struck him. One of those people who think he's like a, a savior of humanity, grab Uthman by his beard. <laughs> the, 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 the Nurain, the possessor of the two lights of Rasulullah, he grabs him and he says, oh you old fool. And then Uthman said to him, he said, if your father saw you right now, what do you think he would say to you? He was the father of a senior, he was the son of a senior Sahabi. My brothers and sisters, what do we learn from this? Don't fall into this. Beware of this. Don't get caught up in drama. You get caught up in drama and you think you're a superhero. I'm going to solve this. I'm going to end corruption. And you know these like, you get into the ghayrat and you get in the thick of things and I'm going to become a superhero and I'm going to stop this and I'm going to get rid of injustice. In the process, what are you doing? You're dishonoring people of honor. You're dishonoring the people of honor. You're putting down and trampling the sanctities of other human beings. A person who is a Sahabi, a person who is a, a man of, of great status when it was in the time of the Prophet, they have no, because they have this vision. Right? Black lives matter. White power. And black lives no matter why, but look at what's happening in this country because of these slogans, right? How many innocent people get trampled and shot? People's uh, windows are broken, people's cars are bombed, and all of it is what? This is a very moral and very great, you know, cause. In that cause, you're causing destruction. Is that a good cause? Lighting buildings on fire, beating up people. People are running away. You're good. You're doing something which is a good cause. Yeah, it's worth it. It's for rights. And for, for, for the sake of rights, how many people are you hurting? For the sake of what you consider like, I'm getting rid of corruption. How many people are you trampling? How much sanctities are you putting under your foot? How many people have to be killed for your cause? Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Ali, all of these great people by these, you know, uh, movements. In every generation, movements. Movements of destruction. It's easy to destroy, but it's very difficult to build. The Prophet ﷺ built. The Prophet ﷺ's jihad, what people don't understand, his jihad was not of jihad of destruction. Wherever he went, when he did jihad, the people ran back to him. They came to him. They became taslim to him. And these people who do jihad now, they're killing innocent people. They're causing destruction wherever they go. They're killing wherever they go. They're making people run away wherever they go. And this is the difference between the jihad of Rasulullah and the jihad of those who come after. It's a very thin line, and it's very dangerous. And this is why the first of, this is why the first of the signs of the end of times, you brothers and sisters, I know this is heavy stuff. I know this is heavy stuff. I know you probably didn't expect, you know, this is probably going to be like, you know, the, I like the one where this, the, you know, the slave girl gives birth to the master, and, and the high-rise building, yeah, that Burj Dubai, let's go back to that one. No, let's come back to reality. Because these are the things that will bring doubts in your mind. Why did they fight after the Prophet ﷺ? Why was there fighting? Because shaitan will never leave them alone. Because the Prophet himself said it's going to happen. You will be tested with this. 
We need to talk about those things that is difficult to talk about. We can talk about the slave girl giving birth to the master and the high-rise buildings. That's there. But this is there as well. This is the hard part. But it's also very important for us to understand the spiritual eschatological background of our history. A non-Muslim might ask you, if your religion is so true, why are there so many wars after your prophet passed away? Muhammad was a prophet of mercy. Why did all the people fight and kill each other after him? Because that the devil and the shaitan, because he himself said that the shaitan and the devil will continue to, one by one, try to destroy this deen. One by one, don't fall into it. But alhamdulillah, we see that shaitan was not successful. How Islam grew, despite the fitan. Because the sahaba kiram radiallahu anhum, they knew where to fight, where not to fight. Where to stand, where not to stand. Where to speak up, where not to speak up. That's why deen spread. We'll inshallah get to that. But the main point is we see what are the first things. The Prophet ﷺ in another hadith, he says, يَتَقَارَبُ zaman That the end of time is going to come near. And يَتَقَارَبُ zaman it means that time will become short. Time will become re restricted. You know, lives will become, you know, time will lose barakah. Time will be very restricted as we see. يَتَقَارَبُ zaman Or the time will come near. And yani the end will come near. And when the end comes near, yuqbadul ilm, knowledge will be lifted. وَتُظْهَرُ fitan, And tribulations will descend. وَيُلْقَ الشُّحْ And people will be spreading greed. وَيَكْثُرُ الْهَرَجْ And killings will become rampant. Killings will become rampant. قَالُوا وَمَا الْهَرَجْ They said, Ya Rasulullah, what, what is this haraj? He said, Al-Qatl. He says in another hadith, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul. لَا تَذْهَبُ الدُّنْيَا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ عَلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمٌ لَا يَدْرِ الْقَاتِلُ فِي مَقُتْقَتَلُ He said the day of judgment will not come until the killer, he does not know why am I killing. And the one who is being killed, he doesn't know why he's being killed. كَيْفَ يَكُونُ ذَلِكَ He said, how will that be? يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ الْهَرَجْ الْهَرَجْ because it's just going to be widespread. People just be, just get into it. Just start doing it. It's just, it's, it's a thing. And we see now in another, it's manifested itself in another way. Is that you have these school killings. A guy go, comes with an AR-15 or with an assault rifle. He goes and just in the middle of a, in the middle of a, like a party, in the middle of a, the public, he just starts emptying clips on people, killing people, indiscriminately. This is also one of the signs of the end of times. Isn't that we're hearing it every other week? Every month there's some killing, mass shootings, isn't it? This is exactly what the Prophet was saying. Like we're seeing it with our own eyes, mass killings. He said there will be mass killings. And the guy himself doesn't know why he's doing it. He's mental. The guy Bechara is mental. He doesn't know why he's doing it. Is, there, is that an objective? No, he was just watching, he was just playing Call of Duty for like 15 years of his life. Yeah. Since he was five years old, he's playing Call of Duty. Now is the time, they're like, it's reality, it's fun, I want to do the real thing. This is too boring, it doesn't satisfy me enough. <laughs> it doesn't satisfy me enough. Okay, go do Call of Duty on people. Now he's doing it on people, headshots. More points for headshots, right? Can you imagine that? It's like you get like a thousand, you get a thousand diamonds for like, you know. And he does, is that, an, is that a real purpose? Like why are you killing people? Because you just, you were playing it on a video game, now that's, I just want to go do it. Why are you doing that? Oh, I just want, I want to get the real thrill. I want to get the adrenaline rush. I want to get the rush. This is not enough rush for me. It's every month, almost every week, and they're actually in the government, the, 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 the politicians, they're announcing it. Said, respected citizens, this seems like it's a every month, every week type of thing that now we're going and unfortunately, our condolences to all the people who lost their families and this and that, it's happening. This is what the Prophet said is going to be happening near the end of times. In another hadith, <clears throat> the Prophet 
or Zubayr ibn Adi says, we came to Anas ibn Malik. This is after the Prophet had passed away. This is after the Prophet had passed away. Atayna Anas ibn Malik. He said, we came to Anas ibn Malik. Fashakawna ilayhi ma nulqi min hajjaj. Ma nulqa min hajjaj. So he says, we complain to him what Hajjaj bin Yusuf is doing to us. Hajjaj bin Yusuf is torturing us. He's oppressing us. He's putting Hajjaj bin Yusuf killed so many tabi'een and sahaba and tortured them and put them in prison because they were speaking the truth. And he was a Muslim governor. So we came and we were complaining to Anas, Oh Anas, what should we do? This is this, 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 this zalim. So he says, Isbiru, Isbiru, be patient. He didn't say, Uqtulu. He didn't say, go kill him. He said, be patient. Be patient. فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَأْتِي عَلَيْكُمْ زَمَانٌ إِلَّا وَالَّذِي بَعْدُهُ شَرٌ مِّنْهُ He said, no era, no time comes except the time before it, but the time after it will be worse than the one before. Every zamana that comes is going to be worse than the zamana before. حَتَّى تَلْقَوْ رَبَّكُمْ Until you meet your Lord. سَمِعْتُهُ مِن نَبِيِّكُمْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم, And I heard this from your messenger, myself. In another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions, إِنَّمَا أَخَافُ عَلَىٰ أُمَّةِ الْأَئِمَّةِ الْمُضَلِّينَ He says, the thing that I fear most for my ummah are those imams and those leaders, you know, these, what you say, these like movements that are going to be leading people astray. And then he said, وَإِذَا وُضِعَ السَّيْفُ فِي أُمَّتِي لَمْ يَرْفَعْ عَنْهُمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ He said, when they're going to start picking up the swords against each other, they're not going to put it down till the day of judgment. Brothers and sisters, we see here an answer to our question. You don't like it, nobody likes it. But remember that this dunya, this is not a perfect world. This is a battleground. It's the battleground of good and evil. People will ask you these questions. There's no easy answer to it. Who is there? Who, who did World War I and II? More than, more than 100 million to 50 million people passed away in World War I and World War II. Did the Muslims do that? So when people are going to be picking at you, that, oh, look at Muslims, as soon as Muhammad passed away, you're fighting one another. This is the history of humanity. We are tested. Greed is always presented to our hearts. Opportunity is presented to our hearts. Min sharril waswas al khannas. The last surah of the Quran talks about the whisperings of shaitan who misguides the hearts of people. This is an ongoing, there's no perfect answer that you're going to give them an answer that, oh, no, this is the answer that this is a reality. And the Prophet ﷺ had foretold it. And this is not only in the Muslim community, this is the human condition. This is not just the Muslim condition, this is the human condition. More people were killed in non-Muslim wars than in Muslim wars. Millions of people were killed. How many people were killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Is that Islam? Just in case somebody's now getting doubt, like, oh, but, but you know, Muslims fighting Muslims, I don't know if that's right. Forget that, it's the human condition. It's not a Muslim condition, it's not a Muslim problem, it's a human problem. But the, but the thing is, did the prof, Prophet give us the solution? Or did he tell us to do it? He didn't tell us to do it. That would be a problem in Islam. That would be a problem of Islam if the Prophet taught us that. But he didn't teach us that. This is the answer. He foretold us of this, that this is the human condition. Shaitan will not leave you until he gets you, right, at each other's necks. But beware when that happens, do not involve yourself. Run as far as you can to not involve yourself in this. The one who strives less, the one who is sitting is better than the one who is standing. The one who is standing is better than the one who is walking. Meaning the less you move and the less active you are, the better it is. You understand? So don't get involved in this because don't let shaitan say, oh, Muslims did this. Muslims didn't do this. This is a human condition. Look at how many people were killed. Just these two world wars, they killed more people than all of humanity, a history of humanity. Just in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, just two bombs, two bombs from the United States. It was enough to 
equal more than all of the history of Islam. Two bombs. Two bombs are more than the entire history of Islam. So who's talking here? Who's pointing fingers here? Let's not point fingers. And this is not about pointing fingers. This is for us to understand what the Prophet wasallam has told us. Inshallah, one more hadith and we'll wrap it up. This one is the last one, inshallah. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As radiallahu narrates that the Prophet said, كَيْفَ بِكَ إِذَا أُبْقِيتَ فِي حُثَالَةٍ مِّنَ النَّاسِ مَلِجَتْ عُهُودُهُمْ وَأَمَانَاتُهُمْ He said, O oh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, what will happen to you when you remain and all the people around you will be the low-life people? All the people around you will be the people who are corrupt in their promises and they don't keep their, their, their covenants. What's that situation going to be, O oh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Subhanallah. وَاخْتَلَفُوا فَكَانُوا هَكَذَا And they are going to differ with one another and fight with one another and they're going to become like this. And the Prophet went like this. O oh, Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As, what's going to happen to you when you're going to be around people that those people are going to be nothing but trouble and they're going to be like this with one another because they're fighting. You know when they fight with one another? They're, you know, banging heads. He said, Ya Rasulullah, فَبِمَا تَأْمُرُنِي So what do you tell me to do? What should I do? You tell me. When I'm in that fitna, when I'm in that situation, قَالَ عَلَيْكَ بِمَا تَعْرَفْ عَلَيْكَ بِمَا تَعْرِفْ وَدَعْ مَا تُنْكِرْ He says, do what is right and stay away from that which you consider to be wrong. Do what is good and stay away from that which is wrong. وَعَلَيْكَ بِخَاصَّةِ نَفْسِكْ Keep to yourself. Don't get involved. We see in a board, we see in two groups, fitnas happen in all communities. Fitnas happen in all communities. And this teaches us, alayka bi khasati nafsik. Keep to yourself. Even if they force you to take sides, don't take any sides. Alayka bi khasati nafsik. Wa iyaka wa awamihim. And beware. Wa iyaka wa iyaka wa awamahum. And beware of getting involved in the drama of people. Some people love drama. That's what makes them alive. Otherwise, life is boring. But then, all the drama and all the fun, you're going to have to be answerable for it. If you want to have fun, you want to be part of the action, some people love the action. They want to be active. This is boring. Sitting around in my house, I want to be part of the action. I want to be active. Okay, then you're going to be answerable for your activity. The more action, as the Prophet said, the more you're going to be involved, the more you're going to be answerable on the Day of Judgment. Subhanallah. Stay close to your house. And hold your tongue. Hold your tongue. Don't be forced to talk we want to hear, what do you say about this? Maulana Saab, what do you say about this? I say that no comment. No, 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 you have to. No, 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 I have a right to remain silent. Yeah, this has actually, I've been put in a situation. No, Maulana, you are a Maulana. This khud, mashallah, Allah wala admi, namazi admi, but he's forcing me to take sides. I said, no, I have the right to remain silent. Anything I can will be used against me in the court of Allah. You know, in the court of law? In the court of Allah. But, mashallah, namazi, mashallah, haji, namazi, sub, and ghibat jari. Mashallah. He's like an AK 47. He looked like, mashallah, crying for the ummah. And then, next minute, the person who does not do like how he does, khalas, like AK 47. Khali me kuna sarish. It's dangerous. This is. Ilzam baytak, keep to yourself. Wa amlik alayka lisanak, and guard your tongue. Wa khud ma ta'arif, do what is right. Wa da'ma tunkir, and leave that which is wrong. You know what is right, you know what is wrong. When you sit there, you feel darkness in your heart when you're talking about another Muslim. You feel darkness in your heart that you just prayed namaz and now everybody's sitting in mashwar, okay, how are we going to blast this guy? 
How are we going to remove this guy? How are we going to, you know, ditch this imam? How are we going to dump this imam? How are we going to dump this other guy? How are we going to plot against this guy? What is this? وَعَلَيْكَ بِأَمْرِ خَاصَةِ نَفْسِكَ And hold and be concerned with your own akhirah. وَدَعَمْ أَمْرَ الْعَامَّةِ Leave the matter of the, the drama with the people. Let them deal with it. Be intelligent. And another hadith, one more. أَنَا بِمُوسَى أَنِ النَّبِيُّ صَاصَمْ إِنَّ بَيْنِ يَدَيِ السَّاعَ فِتَنًا And near the end of time, there will be tests that are going to come at you. Like the darknesses of the night. يُصْبِحُ الرَّجُلُ فِيهَا مُؤْمِنًا وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا he wake up in the morning a believer and by the evening time he will be a disbeliever. And he'll wake up as a believer and he will go into the evening as a believer. In the morning he'll say, I'm a disbeliever. Al-qa'idu fiha khayrun min al-qa'im. The person who is sitting is better than the person who is standing. And the person who is walking is better than the person who is striving and running. Fakassiru fiha qisiyakum. Break your bows. You know, your bow and arrow. كَسِّرُوا فِيهَا قِصِيَّكُمْ Break your bows. Don't use your bow and arrow. Break your AK-47s. Right? وَقَطِّعُوا فِيهَا أَوْتَارَكُمْ Cut the quiver. Or cut the, the autar is the, 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 the string of the arrow. Cut it. وَضْرِبُوا سُيُوفَكُمْ بِالْحِجَارَةِ And take your swords and smash it against the rock. فَإِن دَخَلَ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْكُمْ if someone comes inside of your house, فَلْيَكُنْ كَخَيْرِ إِبْنَيْ آدَمْ Be like the better brother of Adam. So what, you're not supposed to protect yourself if somebody harms you? The Prophet ﷺ here is talking about actual fighting and war. This is what he's talking about. That avoid that. Yani avoid it to the best of your ability. It's not saying that go and let somebody kill you, obviously. But the point here is, is with what emphasis? So us, that those people who say, oh look, this is the, what the Prophet teaches, killing people. He teaches violence. Is this what the Prophet is teaching us? Teaching us violence. He's saying, be the other brother of Adam. Who when his brother came to kill him, he says, oh my brother, inni abu bi ithmi wa ithmik. He says, you, you will carry my sin and your sin if you touch me. I am not going to lift my hand. لَإِن بَسَتَّ يَدَكَ إِلَيَّ لِتَقْتُلَنِي مَا أَنَا بِبَاسِتٍ يَدِيَ إِلَيْكَ لِأَقْتُلَكَ He says, if you stretch your hand to me to kill me, I will not stretch my hand to you, O oh, my brother, to kill you. This is the word of the Habil to his brother Qabil. Be like that and do not stretch your hand to kill and take the life of your brother. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq to understand what has been said. The summary of all of this is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the beginning, the beginning of the fitan and the trials and tribulations st will start like this. So many of the people who actually see these fitan from a historical perspective and say, oh, look at how bad is Islam. Look at how bad is Islamic history. The answer to that, number one is, in every history you have wars. And in every history you have battles and killings. And in every history, you have differences of opinion. But the difference here is, is this what the Prophet taught? The answer to this question is, what did the Prophet teach? And what did the Prophet instruct his community to do about something that is a human condition? Is this the Islamic teachings to kill one another? Is it the Islamic teachings to fight one another? Is it the Islamic teachings to trample on the rights of one another? If that's the teachings, then you're right. You're absolutely right. Yes, Islam is very bad. From the day one, we've been fighting each other because that's what the Prophet taught us. But I ask all of you that are here now, this is the way to understand our history, is this tug of war and this, how do you say, this struggle between good and evil. And what was the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ to us from day one is that when you are in that situation, run from the fitan as much as you can. Do not defile your hands with the blood of another Muslim and be distant from it. Do not fall into any of these uh, fitnas and be aware of it when you, when you see it. Now, when a person sees this fitna and he knows the words of the Prophet, he says, oh, this is not an opportunity. This is not an opportunity for me to be a superhero. This is an opportunity for me to step back and not get my hands covered in the blood of another Muslim. See that sign? 
when you see the sign of infighting, when you see the sign that two groups, and this could be either in blood or in honor. The Prophet ﷺ said, three things of a believer is protected. The blood of a Muslim, and the izzat of a Muslim, the honor, and the mal of a Muslim. So it could be either three. When you see that you're in a situation, and you're made to take sides, to take a decision, to put somebody else down, better to remain silent. But the problem is, and this is why it's called fitna, what do you do if you cannot remain silent? You are a board member. You are the president. You are the imam. You are the main person. Then what? Then that is why it's called a fitna, and that is why, as the Prophet ﷺ said, do what is right. Stay away from that which is wrong. Do what is correct. Do what Allah has commanded in the Sharia. Ali radiallahu anhu had to fight. Omar radiallahu anhu had to fight. Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhu, Imam Hussein was not martyred in Karbala. He had to stand. He had to fight. He had to defend. He had to speak. So when you're in that situation, that's why it's called a fitna. If you can't, then, right? Do what is correct. Stay away from that which is bad. And try to avoid it at, at the best of your ability. And ask Allah Ta'ala's tawfiq. May Allah Ta'ala protect us from these fitan. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, if these situations come in front of us, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala allow us, as He said in another hadith, As-sa'idu man junnib al-fitan. The, 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 the successful person is the one who is protected from these fitnas. That he never even gets involved. He does not get his hands or his tongue defiled in the life or the honor of a Muslim. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.